Oh. Welcome. Episode three, uh, part of Dr. Diazio's course in our journey within entrepreneurship. I'm happy to share today. It's the, again, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. And we have a special guest and programming today that's in line of what we've been learning, learning from a Northern Light, from a beacon, from those who have walked before us, who have left a trail of breadcrumbs to follow, how to manage that special sauce so we are able to transition smoothly or easily into the career paths that we're defining. Uh, but before we get into our, our guest and, and the interview with our, our guest, Amelia Bartlett, I want to suggest a few things about the entrepreneurship program. It is very different than all the other programs in three different ways. One, entrepreneurship and innovation program, students are able to create their own business. So that's a very traditional path and a very important path for not only the Tampa Bay community, but for our, our society. That's one way to generate new businesses, generate uh, GDP in the economy, to create, put people to work. So it, it cannot be understated to how important the role of an entrepreneur and innovator is in starting their own business. The second path or second unique aspect of the entrepreneurship and innovation program is the idea that entrepreneurs are not solo. In fact, they could work in a company. They can work in organizations. Uh, we buy thousands of products yearly, daily, whatever. And these are all forms of innovation or forms of entrepreneurship within an organization. We can think of this as corporate innovation, corporate entrepreneurship, or research and development. And we can go on and on with the list of companies who are innovative or products that are innovative or that are revolutionizing how we do work, how we live, how we experience, et cetera. But probably the third unique aspect of the entrepreneurship program is the idea that we are empowering students and individuals and leaders to create paths that they develop. If that's social media influencers, if those are who are pioneering uh, an adventure through travel, through tiny houses, through school buses, through whatever journey and passion these individuals have, they have the and the encouragement to, to create that. And that's, that's defining their life, their career and their journey, different than majoring in other programs where you are one part of a cog in a bigger wheel and you're meant to uh, hamster wheel in many ways. So today we're gonna touch on those three topics um, and the experiences that our guest Amelia Bartlett uh, brings and the special sauce that she's utilized to create that career path. So I have a, uh, I'm grateful, Amelia, that you're willing to take your time out of your, your busy day to spend uh, with us. And my first question would be, where does this cast find you? And maybe you can bring us up to speed what you've been doing since you left USF, an entrepreneurship program. Sure. So I'm Amelia Bartlett. I'm originally from St. Pete. I grew up in South Pasadena, and then I lived over in the little old downtown by Old Northeast for a little while. And now I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is basically St. Pete with mountains and better seasons. It's really cool. Uh, gosh, since I left college and just full disclaimer, I didn't finish. Shocker. Uh, that's kind of the way of the entrepreneur sometimes. And since college, I Okay, I started a magazine called The St. Petian, which is a lifestyle and culture magazine for St. Pete. It ended up becoming a bit of a cultural club of people who post on Instagram, who fell in love with St. Pete, whether they've lived here their whole lives or they've, you know, just been here for a weekend. But really, more than anything, I'm just proud that some people use the word St. Petian because there was really no term to describe people from St. Pete. And I once heard somebody call us burgers. And I was like, if I do one thing in my life, I will never ever, ever hear that ever again. <laughs> so, and thankfully I haven't, but okay. So I started the same patient. I've been a photographer, a professional marketer. I've run a marketing agency for six years. That's a long time. And then I decided I wanted to uh, transform a school bus into a tiny house, which is kind of the thing where people go, wow, that's a story. And it is, I bought a 40 foot school bus and 
that you guys know where the Chase Bank is on Central Avenue. There used to be a big mural there of a woman who was cutting the cord between these two dudes. And my bus was parked there in the summer of 2017 while we were gutting it. And because we just happened to know someone who owned the parking lot. So we'd go over to World like and get tall boys and gut the bus before we drove it up to Knoxville, Tennessee. And so did that, had an Instagram journey, had a blog, came here to Knoxville uh, and just kind of within my first couple months here, got directly involved with their maker community. Um, one of the things that I really learned in my journey as an entrepreneur is the importance of forming community. Like the word networking makes me want to vomit but like the idea of forming community around yourself it was so important moving to a new city having no friends being an entrepreneur and moving and having no job is very scary because <laughs> you have no clients you have no like who's going to pay you any money to do anything so moving to knoxville i got involved in the maker city and helped them develop the maker city summit which is a yearly two-day event where hundreds of makers come together and do a big educational summit and that really launched me into doing workshops so I became the local Instagram person, not like an Instagram influencer, but like somebody who teaches you how to do Instagram. I have an Instagram masterclass. I have a Pinterest masterclass and none of them are not one of those people who makes money on the internet. I'm one of those people who gives these workshops in person and I have taught workshops in bullet journaling and then eventually just sort of took the marketing, the marketing route track served businesses as a professional marketer, had a few employees, and then, surprise, I decided to get a job because there's nothing like a steady paycheck right before a pandemic happens. So I've been working as a senior manager in a consulting firm. I've been working on and off with this company for many years, but I'm now a full-time employee, salaried, and I get to be an entrepreneur every single day except somebody else signs my paychecks and they deposit into my bank account twice a month. It's extremely secure and nice. So I get to translate all of that experience. And that was a very high level cliff notes version into my day job, which it helps me pay off student debt and live my life. And I still really enjoy the, the daily creativity and problem solving that I get to do. I'd like to dive a little deeper into that. So you gave a range of, experiences, a range of journeys, a range of paths. And while all unique, there may be some uh, overlap in terms of the skills or the capabilities or, or mindset. Uh, so I'm curious to know, as you went through the USF program or as you were at school, how did what you were learning translate to help you in those paths and or your current role? And, you know, is there a connection or how did they help you? So I don't know if, if any of you know about the finger puppet management TV days. Anybody here know about Dr. Diazio's first program for the management class? I tell you, this was management 101. This was like gen pop, not even entrepreneurship students. Like anybody could take this class. And this class was like so frustrating at the beginning because you're like, why do I have to make a TV show episode every week? This is with strangers, right? In a group project. And like, we all know that group projects kind of suck. But seriously, I learned so much in this class because what I found was you had to, you had to manage working with people, right? You had to work with everyone's individual skills because no matter who you were with, everybody was good at something different. Like this person who seemed to have no viable skills was actually very comfortable on camera and very funny and could improv so we didn't have to write a script. Great, made my life easy. Some people are extremely good at like managing the editing and doing all those fine tuned details. That's not me. But one thing I really learned was to excavate the excellence out of every single person that you work with and to really do whatever you can to make them shine. And there's this quote that I really love, a rising tide lifts all boats. And in college, in the entrepreneurship program, we really had this cohort mentality, both in the management class, in creativity and innovation, in scalability, all these different classes. We were all sort of working to make each other look good. We were all working to help each other do our best. And then in these group projects, when we were all trying to just hang on for dear life, I learned those skills 
of self-management, time management, team management. And by having all the organizational stuff like locked down, we could really focus on getting creative and like riffing, problem solving, improving, getting deep meta into an idea. Like we didn't have to focus so hard on like keeping all the plates spinning. We really focused on getting all that stuff in order so that we could play. And the creativity and the innovation and the problem solving was the play. And I'd use that, I, I use that every single day and I attribute to why I have kind of an absurdly great career right now and why like full-blown grown-ups who've been in my industry for 25 years look at me and they're like that's that's the person who's coming up in this industry and I'm like wow all because of all because of that time I spent working with people and learning how to work successfully with them let's unpack that a bit so while we're learning and practicing those skills, maybe at university, was there a certain mindset that you went into each of these projects or each of these tasks to try to maximize your return or to, uh, how did you get yourself game time ready? And what was your approach to that? And you know, how did that help you? So like full disclosure, I was going, I was working full time. I was a professional photographer. I had a job that was like, paying me money. This, this company that I work for now is working part-time for them. I had a full-time photography career and I was renovating a, a real estate investor, like not a gross one, just like somebody who likes to buy houses cheap and make them cute and then make money off of them. But so I'm doing all this stuff and I'm like, yeah, I should also go to college. And before going to college, I'm, I'm 24 or something or 23 when I go to college, I'm, I'm out of high school a while. I'm like, I can either go to college and like slog through and just try to get that paper or I can try to make the most of every single opportunity. Like I can try to make the most of every single day, every single activity, even if it seems dumb, like try to excavate the goodness. I feel like excavate is like the word for me because sometimes you really have to look deep into something to be like, why does this matter? How does this make me better? But I swear to God, if you look hard enough, you'll find something. And that kept me enthusiastic about college because college is amazing, whereas you have access to so much that you do not get in the real world. Like now, I'm like, boy, I wish I was in college so I could meet people. I could have a liaison into a really great interview, or I could connect with an investor for a business, or I could meet with someone who's an expert who's been doing this for 20 years. It's so much easier to find a mentor or a partner or even just an expert, even just somebody who you're like, hey, I heard you're really good at like making wireframes for apps. And this person's like, yes, I will make your wireframe for a case of beer and a little Caesars. Like, <laughs> like that's what I saw college as is like <laughs> the best way to get as far as I could with as much help as possible in the fastest amount of time. It was like shooting out of a rocket. You might be on mute. You gave, Here we go. You, you gave many ex, uh, situations or experiences that you had. So the St. Petian, the schooly tiny house, uh, talk, you mentioned the club this idea of building a community either when you were in St. Pete or when you moved to Knoxville, um, writing, consulting, all of these, you know, are a combination of the skills that you had, some of the skills that you learned, but at the same time, um, different di new experiences. And I'm wondering, sometimes going from zero to one is scary. And my, my question to you is, were you scared or didn't know everything in advance? And how did you deal with that? Or how did you overcome some of that fear to, to start, which could be the biggest inhibitor because there are many talented students in my classes, but going from zero to one sometimes can be scary. So what advice or did you face with, it, with, with these types of challenges? So here's like two really scary instances, right? There's one scary instance where I realize I'm going to have to charge $2,000 worth of magazines to the only credit card that has any money left in the limit if I'm going to make my launch date because I don't have enough pre-orders and I have to have magazines to sell. So 
that was scary. <laughs> Just to charge that money and hope for the best. And the second scary thing was the moment when I signed the title on a 40 foot school bus and it was time to drive that thing out of the parking lot. And I can tell you, I've never driven a school bus before. I've never even driven a truck. <laughs> so the idea of getting into a class E vehicle, which surprisingly doesn't require a special license to drive. So, so you guys know that. At that point, it's kind of like ripping off a Band-Aid if a Band-Aid is like, I don't know, a cast on a broken arm. You just got to be like, okay, it's time. It's, it's time. The worst I can do is fail. And the way that I think about it is like this. My favorite movie is this strange Korean film called I'm a Cyborg, but that's okay. And one of the characters is constantly afraid of vanishing into a dot. And when I think how scared I am, I'm like, I'm not going to vanish into a dot. Even if I fail, even if I get hurt, even if I lose everything, and I can tell y'all right now, I have lost everything. Like a year and eight months ago, I was homeless. I was living out of a hotel room that a friend paid for me for one week and said, get your shit together. Like I, even if you lose everything, you're not going to cease to exist. You're not going to vanish into a dot. The people who love you truly are not going to leave you. And you will always be able to get back on your feet. So the best thing you can do is fail hard and fail big. Wonderful. I want to riff off of a, a, a few things that you mentioned. You talked about, you taught journaling. You talked some master classes. Uh, we might have you come back and maybe you, if you would be open to sharing a bit sure. about those master classes. Sure. Uh, we did have in the past a master podcasting, but I think some of what you're offering would also complement what we're doing here. You talked about journaling. What role is journaling played for you in terms of learning or growth or self-development? And is there any books or a next step? Because we do journaling here, but is there something that students can continue on with their with their self-development without being prescribed them requiring them to do that so journaling is not easy and i say that in all honesty as a writer as a published writer as someone who writes for the paper as someone who's published short stories like journaling is vulnerable it's directionless at times it's am it's ambient but at the same time committing to journaling, like committing to sitting down and actually fleshing out your thoughts. The the one tool that really like did this for me, I've not always been a really good journaler, but, and I, I have this book at my desk like all the time. And so you might hear some noise because my dog's coming back from the dog park, but I have this book. It's called The Artist's Way. I'm going to give y'all quick tip. This book is woo. It's weird. Use the word God. If you're not into God, like it's not about religion. It's a woo book that is about getting in touch with your ability to flounder, your ability to spill, your ability to unload whatever's happening up here without judgment, without structure, without any need for it to be something at the end, without having to like publish it or post it or even reread it. They have this tool in this book, The Artist's Way called morning pages it's three pages of just stream of consciousness like word vomit on the page and at the beginning they even write this in the book they're like you're going to be writing in your morning pages and you're going to be like what am i supposed to be writing about i don't want to be writing and i can tell you i've written whole journaling pages of this is stupid i don't want to do this but the discipline of sitting down and journaling every day just writing out whatever's in your head, whether it's the dream you had, whether it's an idea you have, whether it's some drama that's happening at work or drama that's happening in your family. Just unloading your brain is about creating a clean slate where the rest of your creative energy and the rest of your subconscious energy can be used for things you actually care about because your brain's chewing on stuff anyway. It's thinking about stuff anyway. If you get it out of your head, you start to create space for workability. And that for me, journaling is where I find workability. My brain is just 
I can't process the way I can, whether it's on paper. Sometimes I'll just talk to my phone on like a voice memo. I'll just like, you know, have something to say, or I will have seen something, but releasing those thoughts and hearing them aloud, getting that feedback, reading or audio, I just find that it works wonders for processing and it works wonders for digesting thoughts and ideas. And it's a, it's a tool I always turn back to no matter what medium it takes. Excellent. I, I'm familiar with the book. So this is an idea that if you guys want to continue developing yourself or self-development, what potentially is available, the, that book could be something that yeah. you could easily turn to. In it's addition to it, I would... Like it's a program, oh, it's a program that you program. do. Okay. Yeah, I I highlight the hell out of mine. Like I use like I write notes in the margins, like so many notes in the margins. But it's a weekly program. So if you just go through each week, it it's called a spiritual path to higher creativity. And as someone who just I'm not a painter, I'm not like I don't write poetry, I'm not like any sort of that kind of artist. It really does unlock the true creativity and the true drive that you have towards whatever your truth is and whatever you're really interested in, it gives you a super highway to it because of the way the activities are structured. And there's activities and like actually doing things in the real world that are in relationship to creativity. It's really good. Cool. I think this complements the creativity assessment projects that we do in our creativity and innovation class. And I would suggest that this idea of journaling, one, it's creating space so you can focus and remove that 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 lizard brain or that, that constant monkey mind. But even when you're writing about your ideas, we can see this as a way of flushing them out or a prototype or a mock-up or trying to get that story correct or things that you can questions and assumptions as well. And these are forms of, of this iterative process, a form of this creative process, deferring judgment, uh, making space, making connections, making random, um, connecting things that aren't traditional. And you guys have to do that in the Shindogo exercise for one of the classes. So we can start seeing how this reinforces a lot of the main concepts, the mindset, the behaviors, the activities that we want uh, students, entrepreneurs, and innovators to have. So I'm gonna prime the students I have two more questions for Amelia, but I, I would like to prime the students to think and write down uh, if you guys have a question and maybe we, you guys will have an opportunity to, for a Q&A um, with her. So before we go to the Q&A with the students, I, I have a quick question. We're kind of riffing, but what's next, Amelia? Uh, you've done so many things. You've, oh, been, yeah. you've, you've lit in the beacon. You've, you've been the Northern Light. You've tried these. You see the connections. You've connected the dots. Now you're working for a consulting company, but I know you well enough to say that's probably not the end game. So what, what's next? Okay, so first of all, uh, Dr. Diaz is trying to get me to come back to college and finish my degree, which I might do. I might do. Why? Why? Because I'm at a company who will pay me more money for going to school and they will pay for me to go to school. So like, I'm telling you, stuff that I learned as an entrepreneur is what makes me an irreplaceable employee. So yes, you're absolutely right. This is not the end game. Although over the next year, I'll go from senior manager to director, to director. I'll go into making well into six figures, which is, which is crazy. I would have never imagined doing something like that, especially going to school for entrepreneurship. But my goal is to I also, uh, Steve heard this this morning, but this morning I got up and went rock climbing, did my morning routine, and then auditioned for a commercial because my real passion lies in the performing arts. So for me, I have a ton of debt from that bus project that I've told you guys about, from the magazine project I've told you about, from going to college. I'm a millennial, so I'm going through this big, nice job, this big, nice career to smooth out my financial future and then save up so that I can take a year off of work so that I can make some really good indie films, work with some people in my community, because like Tampa Bay, Knoxville has an incredible film community. And something that I bring when I'm on a film set and when I'm on a film project is that I'm an entrepreneur and I'm business-minded. I know how to distribute projects. I know how to network. I know how to drum up social media following. 
I know how to create community around an idea. I know how to raise investment dollars. And I know how to communicate with the people at the table who are wondering, how is this piece of art going to make me a return on my investment? So these are the kind of connections and this is the kind of experience that I didn't realize I needed for my future as a differentiated talent in the performing arts. So I would say that that's what's next for me. I have a couple of other projects that I'm working on. I'm still in real estate. This is another little investment property that I am renovating and working out of. But the goal is to get through the corporate experience, really make a decent amount of money so that I can invest in my own production company and move into the next stage of my arts career. Great. And you can yeah. see that she's planning and thinking things out in order to execute one and, and the, the next related project. The next Projects and plans, <laughs> always. <laughs> um, so just to piggyback off of one other, you, so you're interested in the performing arts. We do, uh, sometimes um, every time we meet, we have a, a colleague who runs some improv. So I'm, and, and we believe that, or I believe that there is a connection between uh, the arts and, and creativity, the arts and entrepreneurship, the arts. And I'm wondering what it, as an actor, how does that help you pitch or how does that help you be, give a presentation? And is there a connection and do they reinforce each other? So the connection might not be what you think. So the thing about an audience, right? Any audience, any, any person to whom you are communicating, whether it is authentically, performatively, whatever, is your audience. And the whole point of the performance is to resonate with, in some way, with the audience. So as a person who interacts with other people, I am constantly thinking, what is my audience listening for? What language is my audience speaking? Why is my audience here? What are they here to get out of this experience? And how is this going to be something that resonates with them long term, that they take with them? So I'm, I'm a fairly consistently successful pitcher, person who pitches. And I pitch a lot internally because I'm always asking for money. <laughs> I'm always like, I need you to fund my idea within my company. I, we need a PR company. I need an overhaul of this side of our, I need to develop a new product. I need this software. I want to white label that software. I am constantly asking for money more than anybody else at the company. But what I find is that when I tune into my audience and I tune into what they need and what they're listening for, my leaders are looking for data for decision support. That's what they need. And so I am thinking, how can I communicate with them? They're busy. They want a short pitch. They need data for decision support. So it needs to be something they understand, but something they can be thinking about and chewing on while I'm talking. So like they need to be thinking about sentence one and two. Sentence three and four is not that important. Sentence five and six should bring them back to earth. And the final sentence should close it up and they should be willing to sign my check. So keeping that in line with my commitment as a performer when I'm acting in a role, thinking about what my audience is getting out of my performance, it's the exact same thing. Different languages and different listening. Excellent. Wonderful. I'd like to open the floor to the students. If you have any questions for, for Amelia, we, we have a lot to chew on and a lot to digest, but maybe we can bring it back home to Pat's questions that you guys have personally, or uh, she's gone through many of these courses or uh, other questions that, that might have provoked in you? If you just want to unmute yourself. This is my favorite part when there's no questions and we all just kind of sit here staring at each other's faces. Is anybody going to say anything? <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask, um, so is this school bus thing, like our tiny homes, excuse me, is that still interested, something you're interested in pursuing like long-term or is that just like a project that you've completed? I, that is definitely not something I'm interested in long-term because um, I can tell you, so I have a 90 pound greyhound among other pets and 
all of us in a 200 square foot school bus with six foot ceilings uh, through the winter with a wood stove and a composting toilet was enough for me. I can't say that. Also, also, I will say living full time. No, I wouldn't want to live in a tiny house full time, but I would totally like van do a van renovation and a van camp because I still love the architecture, like the architectural creativity of tiny homes. But I really learned that I'm not a minimalist liver. And it's also extremely impractical to park a 40 foot bus literally anywhere. You can't bring that sure. thing many, many places. If you were going to do it, I would highly advise a short bus, like something that's mm-hmm. 24 feet. And like you build a platform on top, so you have like outdoor living space because otherwise you can't you can't park on the side of the road, you can't park in parking lots, you can't park at rest stops unless they have truck parking. You have to buy gas at the truck gas station. You know how hard that is? That's hard. It's like complicated the way that truckers get gas. So there's just all these logistical challenges that didn't really make sense. And I would highly not advise towing a tiny house behind a truck because when your house comes loose on the highway, because all that's holding it together is a tow hitch, you're going to be very upset. Definitely go short bus or van life. Noted. Okay. Yeah. What are the questions question. about you have? Yes. Um, so it wasn't really related to what you talked about, but do you have any like tips for entrepreneurs to like build a resume if they plan on getting a job? Yeah, totally. So with resumes, I try to be as sort of thinking of like honest, honest, direct, but descriptive of what you do. So for example, do you have a, do you have a business that you are like, this is what I do, but now I'm trying to get a job? Not currently. No. Okay, so let's use me as an example, right? Like I had a marketing company and on my resume, it says managing partner of my marketing company because I technically had another person who worked with me, but like, "Eh, I just didn't want it to be like CEO or something like that because it wasn't that kind of organization. But what I was really clear about beneath that title was the things that I was responsible for. Always action items, responsibilities, and accountabilities. Because what people will get out of your resume is what you're capable of in your day-to-day life. So be really direct and confident in stating the most exemplary aspects of what you do. And technically, like, I don't do random resume drops. I do not submit resumes to companies that I don't know anyone at. I instead go find someone at that company. Like literally, I will stalk people. I will talk to all my friends. I will talk to Mr. Dr. Diazio, who I always call Steve. So it feels kind of weird for like, but like I would talk to Steve. I would literally talk to anyone, you know, like any reasonable adult. And be like, this is what I do. I need you to like, give me a handshake liaison where like all three of us go get coffee together and then you'll get the job. Like giving people raw resumes to like applications. I totally get that that's how the system works. I do not advise because you'll end up just, it's a numbers game and you have no idea who you're going to end up with. So like, just go the extra mile to like dig into a company that you want to work for. And always, always, always reach out to your network. Always tell people that you know that you are looking for a job. I think that some people are like a little bit vulnerable about that. They're like, oh, I don't want people to know I'm looking for a job. I'm like, okay, well, then you're not going to get hired. Like, I only want to work with my friends. I only want to work with cool people. I only want to work somewhere that's ideologically in line with what I do. So those are my friends. Great. Awesome. Thank and you. remember, we're, we're, we're working on projects right now in our classes. So those are experiences and projects that you can demonstrate a lot of these key skills and you can mm-hmm. craft it in ways that it's not schoolwork. These are consulting build, and innovation projects. And build a website. Like, I cannot tell you how many times people tell me 
and this is embarrassing because like I don't even really update my website that much people are like oh, I read your blog I read your website I I really think you're I love your story and I'm like oh my god like you did that due diligence and you like look I mean like I just write about my garden on my blog or like literally whatever I feel like writing about but having a little corner of the internet that you own that is not social media not your LinkedIn, like your website where it's like, this is who I am as a person. Publish the work that you do. Like just get a cheap Squarespace. Every time you do a project in Steve's class, create a little blog post, do little like samples, make a little video about it and publish it and have it put together as like a little collection on your portfolio homepage. So yes, you're like, yeah, I'm a student, but like I'm going through one of those extremely unique college programs that actually gives you experience because most people, most employers could give a shit about college. I don't have a college degree. And that has not stopped me from becoming the youngest senior manager at my company in history and soon to be the youngest director. So it's like, it's more about the experience, but it's extremely important to tell your story and to provide receipts. And that starts to build a portfolio, which is something that differentiates us compared to other programs where they don't know what a portfolio is. So, you know, you can have a portfolio of companies, you can have a portfolio of experiences, and you're demonstrating that through your mock-ups, through your presentations, or however you want to craft your story, and these are supporting evidence for it. And, you know, that's something that was unique for the class that Amelia took in management, right? worked on a tv show project we created seven episodes look that. how amazing it is it's a resume. story about diversity yeah that so, was in my and, portfolio where some where some of those episodes like pe people could see that like i could show up for a project i could work as a team with other human uh, persons like people of all different mm -hmm. ideologies and all different intellect levels we all could work together to produce something like that was a part of my okay so Finger puppet management was part of my portfolio in college. Um, my team with creativity and creativity and innovation, we won an inner class competition to do a training program for Kobe marketing, like Kobe marketing selected our project to deliver, to train their new hires. That was a part of my portfolio. Like St. Petian was obviously part of my portfolio, but St. Petian only happened because of my group at, at USF and my work with Sipsi, I've led workshops in polarity management at the Sipsi competition. And like, I wasn't a presenter. You could like sign up to teach a workshop, like on a little board. It was like a, a creativity conference. You could just sign up and anybody could come to your workshop. And like, I don't know, 15 people came and I made sure that like my friends took pictures. But then I could say I taught a workshop at, you know, the Creative Problem Solving Institute that people actually came to. Who cares if it wasn't a who cares if I wasn't an official presenter? It looks good. These are ways to tell your story. Wonderful examples. Thank you. Yeah. Last question that I have for you, Amelia, is if you could go back to your younger self and provide some advice, what would you tell yourself to either uh, do differently or what, what would you share with yourself um, if you could go back to t talk to your younger self? I think I would tell myself to go further, to do more, to talk to more people, to ask for help more, to um, actually go after. So one thing I didn't get to do was internships because like I had a job and I don't work for no money. So, but I would have gone after more diverse opportunities to engage in the community with professionals that I look up to. Like I had the opportunity to work with Michelle Royal, who is somebody that I really look up to in the community. She's the owner of Ridge Consulting. And she was actually a guest professor of the year that I went to college. And I wish I would have gone and done an internship or just even like a four week event with her. Like I wish I would have badgered Nate Schwagler until he let me go to the Dali program and like work with him for six weeks. I wish I would have badgered Steve to connect me with some of his international contacts. Cause like this man has contacts all over the world for entrepreneurship. Like he knows people like big, important, smart, brilliant people. I wish I would have gone to Denmark to study. Like Denmark's one of the most creative and innovative countries in the entire world. And we happen to have connections there through this program 
with Steve, with Nate, with the Foresight program. Like the Foresight, I don't know if you guys have heard of this. Those people let me take their certification for free. A $2,500 certification, a three-day certification, because I was in college. Like I became the youngest official Foresight certified practitioner at that time. Like because I was in college, I would have done more of that. I would have pitched my face off. I would have done literally, I would have not slept and just done as much as humanly possible because the amount of experience that I got was so incredible. I can only imagine how much further I could have gone if I really dove deep and really just dug my heels into St. Pete and didn't let up. I want to say thank you, Amelia, for spending uh, the morning with us. Your insights, uh, concrete examples, helping the students make these connections and, and wisdom and really being that northern light for, for many of us and for those who are who are following and looking for a path. So I, I cannot say thank you and be grateful enough for, for spending the time. I want to have you back and we can discuss more. But again, uh, thank you. Let's give Amelia a big round of applause. This is how we do it on your on sign language. But uh, thank you and I will be in touch. Sure. If anybody wants to ask questions or whatever, um, ask Steve for my email. Feel free to reach out. It was really nice to get to talk to you guys. Thanks for having me as a guest on your cast. And I hope you guys really get a lot out of what you're doing at USF because for being a little school in a little town, it it's a special place that's unlike any other in the country. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.